This morning we want to take some time and think about this short passage from God's Word that we have read. It's a uh, It's help in the time of trouble. Help in the time of trouble. And trouble is something that we all experience. None of us at any stage are immune from it. We never know what tomorrow will bring. We might be uh, free from trouble today, but uh, we never know what uh, another day or another week will, will, will unfold. In 1 Corinthians Uh, chapter 1 and verse 27 we read these words but God chose what is foolish in the world uh, to shame the wise God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong now from this verse and from many other verses in the Bible we recognize that the way of God is vastly different from the way of the world because The world in which we live chooses uh, most of the time the high and the mighty, the bright and the beautiful, the strong and the assertive types to be its leaders, to be its role models, to be its celebs. In our society there is what we might call the cult of the celebrity. And these celebs are received and they are acclaimed And they are idolized and they are worshipped and almost treated like gods. But God's way is very different. God's way is very different. Throughout the Bible, he uses the meek and the lowly and the humble to accomplish his purposes. Remember how Jesus came into the world, born in humble circumstances in a little village, Bethlehem and growing up in small despised town of Nazareth. And in these verses that are before us in 2 Kings, we see how God displayed his glory through a minister's widow, through a prophet's wife. This widow found herself in great financial difficulties after her husband's death. She was destitute. She had no money whatsoever to pay pay her bills. Yet through the face of this simple widow, God not only met her needs, but demonstrated to a watching world his power and his divine glory. As we look in detail at this gracious and glorious miracle, we will see how we can bring glory to God even when trouble overtakes us. So the first point we want to establish is this. The righteous not immune from trouble. The righteous not immune from trouble. When we begin to read a passage of scripture like this, we we tend to be in such a hurry to get to the spectacular that we miss some of the important details given to us by the Holy Spirit in the text. For example, who was this woman who had fallen on hard times? Verse 1. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha. So although we don't know her name, we know that she was a prophet's wife. She was a wife to a man in Israel who'd received the same calling as Elijah and Elisha. A man who had been called to proclaim the word of the Lord in his generation. But but what kind of prophet was he? We we know that there were false prophets in those days. For example, uh, Zedekiah, of whom we read in 1 Kings 22 and verse 11, was such a false prophet because we we read there that he prophesied falsely in the name of the Lord. Well, this woman's husband was not like that because notice what she says to Elisha in verse 1 your servant my husband is dead and you know you know Elisha that your servant feared the Lord in other words he was a good man he was a godly man he was a man who spoke truly the word of the Lord a man who had not been intimidated 
by the threats of Ahab and the maliciousness of Jezebel. This man would have been among the 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed the knee to Baal in the days of Elijah. So against the drift of popular opinion, in the, fear, in the face of the fierce persecution of Jezebel, here was a man who feared the Lord. Here was a man whose, whose aim in life was to serve the Lord and give devotion to the Lord. A man who had put God first in his life. Now we could describe him today as a good man, a godly man, a man who stood uh, beside his wife, who was faithful to him, and their, their marriage was blessed with, with two children. But on this godly family in Israel, a number of hard providences had come, one after another in the series of devastating blows. Three things that we can identify. The first devastating blow was the family got into serious debt. Now, how the debt was incurred, we're not told. Maybe the, the prophet had rented uh, some, some ground, but it didn't produce a crop. Or maybe he had miscalculated some trends in a business deal. Whatever was the cause, this man had died in debt. A fact that had disastrous consequences for his widow and her children. And so we see from this that the godly are not necessarily preserved from trouble, financial or other trouble. There are some who preach that true godliness leads to financial success, the, the health and wealth gospel advocates. But the Bible does not teach that. That is not the message of the word of God. Jesus did not teach that. A would-be disciple said enthusiastically to Jesus one day, Matthew 8, verse 19, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Uh, and Jesus, as it were, put the brakes on him. Uh, consider carefully what your intentions are, because he said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. <clears throat> so there there will be sacrifices to be made if you follow me. The woman that Jesus held up before his disciples as a model of godliness in Luke 21 had just given as her offering, we are told, two very small copper coins worth a fraction of our penny. That was all that she had, all that she had in all the world. A godly woman but very, very poor. Godliness does not inevitably lead to material prosperity. Think of persecuted Christians in many parts of the world, the greatest saints of God on earth. Some of them have lost all and incurred great debts because of their love and loyalty to Jesus Christ. Here was a woman who who found herself in that category, in debt and in great poverty. <clears throat> so the family had got into serious debt. The second devastating blow was the loss of a loved one. Now God's word does not fill in the details. <clears throat> All we know is that suddenly the prophet died. A man whose godly life was known to Elisha. Verse 1 again, your servant, my husband, is dead. The woman was in great affliction. She was in great sorrow and great grief. <clears throat> and the legitimate question that may have crossed her mind was, why? Why, God, did you not preserve his life? For he was needed. He was needed uh, for so many reasons. <clears throat> For this woman as a widow, <laughs> his wife's future looked bleak and barren. The two boys would have been growing up without their father's example and without his leadership. And then 
The most obvious one is the debt, which now seemed impossible to clear by the widow or her children. So this widow may have had these questions and many more besides. And let it be said that when trials overtake the righteous, there is no easy answer. We just need to keep on trusting and keep on relying on God because he is a loving Heavenly Father and he knows what he is doing. Then the third blow to strike and devastate this poor family was the merciless nature of their creditor. On top of her poverty and the loss she had incurred, this woman was about to experience the loss of her two sons who were to be taken away as slaves by the creditor. Now, now we ought to say at this point that the creditor was within his rights to take the boys. The law made provision for this in the case of debt. However, in the circumstances, a merciful creditor, a merciful man would have waived his rights and let the boys stay at home. But such was not the nature of this man. And so this poor woman was about to suffer another devastating blow. The loss of her two sons for up to seven years. For the law in Israel was that on the seventh year, all slaves were to be released. And so from the situation of this poor widow, we see that the righteous are not immune from hardship. Peter writing to Christians who were experiencing suffering writes in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And we should not be surprised if in some way or other the sufferings of Christ pour over, pour over into our lives. Many Christians, as you know, in the world are suffering intensely because of their love and loyalty to Jesus Christ. And maybe maybe some of you, unknown to me, unknown to others in the congregation, are, are suffering even today, because of your faith, because of your loyalty to Jesus Christ. The righteous not immune from trouble. Then secondly, the righteous, their response to trouble. What is the response of this widow before us in the passage? Does she sit in the corner feeling sorry for herself? Does she become embittered and become cynical? Did she curse God and and die, as Job's wife told him to do in the midst of suffering? Well, not at all. In the spirit of faith, she, she brings her dilemma to the man of God. In her trial, she went to Elisha. And the manner of her approach gives us an insight into the intensity of her request. Verse 1, she cried out to Elisha. She didn't just say, oh, Elisha, I have something to tell you. No, she came uh, with, with passion in her plea. She cried out to Elisha. She was in dire straits. She needed help. We might ask the question, why did she go to Elisha? Did she go to him to get money to pay her debts? Well, that would have been silly because he had no money. Did she go to Elisha to get him to speak to the creditor? Well, again, that would have been foolish because the law was on his side. So then why? Why did she speak to Elisha? Because he was the prophet of God. And so in this earnest cry to Elisha, she was, in effect, crying out to God. 
This woman believed that somehow, in some way, God was able to deliver her from her troubles. Maybe she had heard what God did for the widow of Zarephath in Elijah's time when the oil and meal did not run out until rain came. Whatever her past experience, we see here a woman, in spite of many hard providences, expressing confidence in God through coming to his servant, Elisha. This is a lesson for us. This is what our response ought to be in difficult and distressing times, when it appears that our whole world is caving in. We too should cry out to our Father in heaven. We too should come to him with with a degree of passion in our plea for help, knowing that he is our Father who loves us and that he is more willing to provide uh, a solution to our problems than, than we can ever dare think about or imagine. And in coming to God in the midst of our trials, we should claim his promises That's what faith is all about. That's what prayer is all about. Claiming the promises of God. Promises are a a great blessing to to the godly. We see in the the psalmist in Psalm 119 and from verse 49. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction. So the psalmist is is turning to to the word of God uh, and he reads it and it gives him hope. This is uh, my comfort, he says, in my affliction. Just to note a few of the promises that apply to this situation. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Uh, And Some people in the midst of great trial and trouble have known the presence of Christ, a reality, an even greater reality than than when things were going well. Psalm 34, verse 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. So cry to God. He will hear and he will answer. The Apostle Paul knew personally that the righteous are not immune from trouble and he experienced more trouble than any of us combined. And he also knew that God gives grace which is sufficient to sustain during the trial. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9, he had that thorn in the flesh that, that was plaguing him, that was troubling him, that was afflicting him. Three times he says, I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But God's answer was always no. And then God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And when Paul heard that, he said, I will glory all the more in my weaknesses. Because if that displays the power of God, well, that will be wonderful. And we should do the same. The righteous not immune from trouble. The righteous, their response to trouble. And then, finally, the righteous delivered from trouble. The righteous delivered from trouble. We've already been alluding to some of the the promises which the righteous can claim in the hour of trial. And one of them is that deliverance will surely come. Now, deliverance came for this woman in an unexpected way. Verse 2, the prophet says to her, Tell me, tell me, what have you in the house? I'm sure she didn't expect that question, but she responded. And she said, Your servant is nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Not very much. But she was called to exercise her faith. She was called to collect all the containers that she could borrow and pour oil into them. 
And the oil that she had in the jar kept on running until the very last pot was full. And by selling the oil, she had sufficient money to, to pay off her creditors and to live on the rest. Notice that God required her to use what she had. And with God's blessing on the little that she had, there was an abundance which completely met her need. Now God could so easily have filled her pots and containers with gold and silver and precious stones, but no, that is seldom how God works. God chose to use what she already possessed. And with God's blessing on that little, it lifted her, it delivered her out of all her distress. And when we cry to God in all our need and in all our weakness, God would say to us, What do you have? What do you have? In other words, don't sit in the corner and wallow in self-pity. Don't go around feeling sorry for yourself. Consider what you still have. Family, friends, a home, health, ability to work, gifts, resources of one kind or another. They may seem very meagre, but with God's blessing on those meagre resources, he can accomplish much to meet your every need. When the 5,000 were needing faith, fed, Jesus said to the disciples, What do you have? Five small loaves and two fish. The disciples protested, But what are they? What are they among so many? But with the Lord's blessing upon them, they were sufficient to feed the 5,000. And there were, was bread left over. When David met, went to meet the giant Goliath, what did he have? What did he have in the satchel? Five small, smooth stones. Saul, the king, scoffed at the weapon. Goliath, the giant, mocked and ridiculed the weapon. But with God's blessing on those meager resources, they were sufficient. What do you have? Above and beyond the little oil in the jar, this woman had faith. She believed in the Lord and she exercised that faith to the glory of God. So how important, how important faith is. Hebrews we read, without faith, without faith it is impossible to please God. So the big question the fundamental question this morning is this. Do you have faith? Do you have faith in God to meet your daily needs? Now we all have basic requirements. The need for food and clothing. The need for heat and shelter. The need for family and friends. The need for health and strength and work. Thankfully, we have a Father in heaven who knows all about these needs. As Jesus said in his famous sermon, your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And so we're to trust him. Yes, we're to act responsibly. We're to use whatever resources he has given us. But we're to trust him, to rely on him, to meet all our practical needs. But having said that, Jesus went on in the sermon to say that there's something much more basic that you require as well. The need for salvation. The need to be right with God. The need to be, to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And so he went on to say, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That should be your priority irrespective of whatever other problems are, 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 are affecting you and afflicting you in this life. Seek first the Lord. Seek him as your Lord and Master. And then all these other things will be taken care of. We are living 
in ungodly days. We're living at a time in our history when many oppose the gospel and to trample on the commandments of the living God. And you and I, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, are to seek first his kingdom. We are to devote our lives to him and seek to implement his rule wherever we have influence or wherever God has placed us. And with regard to the troubles and difficulties, we don't really have any need to worry about them. We are to cast all our anxieties upon him, as we were reading in 1 Peter 5, because he cares for us. The righteous, not immune from trouble. The righteous, their response to trouble. The righteous, delivered from trouble. It may be like the Apostle Paul. Our difficulties will never be completely removed in this life. If that is God's purpose, be assured of this, that God will give the grace sufficient to bear the burden. As he said to Paul, so he says to us, my grace is sufficient for you. Of course, when we are released from this earth, when we pass away from this scene of time, when we die, we will be set free, perfectly free, from all earthly trials and troubles and testings. And we will delight in the glory of heaven, as Paul assured the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4.17. For this slight momentary affliction and his afflictions were anything but slight uh, as, as we survey them. But that's how he put it. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What a thought. What a blessing. What anticipation for the blessing that we wait in glory. God used the faith of a simple, unnamed widow in Israel to demonstrate his power and display his glory to the world of that day and to every believer who reads the Bible. May Christ use you as well to demonstrate his power and to display his glory through the life that he has called you to live and through your witness to Jesus Christ, your Lord and Master. Amen.